Let's begin with our call to worship. This is the day which the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Amen. And as I like to do for our baptism, we like to do it in the beginning of the worship service because it's symbolic that they're entering into the Christian faith. And so we enter into the worship service with our baptism. So can all of those who want to have a good view of Ronan, Colin, and Winter getting baptized, you guys are all welcome to come on up here and, and stand up here at this area. Come on, family, friends, sponsors, anybody who's taught them Sunday school or anything, any reason you want to come on up, you can come on up. They're like, you can stand, yes, come on, stand up around the... You can huddle around this, the baptismal font, both sides, there's plenty of room. Okay. Dearly beloved, let us hear the command of our Lord Jesus Christ concerning holy baptism. All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit teaching them to observe all that I command you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Let us in the next place hear how graciously our Lord Jesus Christ receives little children and opens the door of the kingdom of God for them. And they were bringing children to him that, so that he might touch them, and the disciples rebuked him. But when Jesus saw this, he was indignant and said to them, Permit the children to come to me. Do not hinder them, for the kingdom of God belongs to such as these. Truly, I say to you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God like a child shall not enter it at all. And he took them in his arms, and he began blessing them, laying his hands upon them. So, in thankfulness and in faith, we bring our children to the Lord in holy baptism in order that they may share in his blessing, and though they are sinful human beings under the law of sin and death, may become children of God by grace in the washing of of regeneration and the renewing of the Holy Spirit. Let us pray. Eternal and almighty God, we thank you that in your church you have instituted baptism into your name and that in baptism you promise to be our Father, to save us from sin through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Redeemer, and to regenerate and sanctify us by your Spirit. Receive these children which we bring before you today and let them receive eternal blessings of holy baptism. Grant that they may grow up in your church as your children. Let the fear and love of God prevail in their homes. Teach them to fear and love you, and preserve them from all evil until they shall come to you in your heavenly kingdom. Amen. Okay, to the parents, I have questions for you. Do you renounce the devil and all his works and all his ways? If so, answer, yes, I renounce them. Do you believe in God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit? If so, answer, yes, I believe. Do you, do you parents desire that these children shall be baptized into the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit? If so, answer, I do. And do you promise to instruct them in the word of God and nurture them in the chastening and admonition of the Lord? If so, answer, I do. Okay, now we get to do what we came here for. Let's do Ronan first. Where's Ronan? You're Ronan? Okay. Ronan, can you move your head kind of just over this a little bit? Dip it all the way in over here. There you go. I baptize you, Ronan, in the name of the Father, and in the name of the Son, and in the name of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Okay. Colin, come on up. <laughs> here, wait. Ronan, I got something for you. This will help a little bit. There you go. <laughs> Colin, tip your head up over here. Colin, I baptize you in the name of the Father, and in the name of the Son, and in the name of the Holy Spirit. Amen. And here's yours. There you go. And Winter, the one who started this all. I baptize you in the name of the Father, and in the name of the Son, and in the name of the Holy Spirit. Amen. I try to make it warm. Hopefully it wasn't too hot, right? Okay. My pastor growing up always said that was the most important thing about the water was it wasn't cold. Cold water. Okay. There you go. Perfect. Okay. 
Almighty God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has made you his children and has received you into his believing church, strengthen you with his grace unto everlasting life. Amen. Sponsors. I'm guessing sponsors right here, right? Okay, some questions for you. Do you promise to encourage the parents of these children in their God-given privilege of raising them, to pray for them, and to assist them in any way necessary for the spiritual welfare of these children? If so, answer, I do by the grace of God. In the event that these children are not able to care, that the, the parents of these children are not able to care and instruct them in the Christian faith, you have committed yourselves to undertake that responsibility. Do you promise that you will pray for them and that you will see that they are given the instruction in Christian faith and that they are fully brought to divine worship until the day when they are of age? If so, answer, I do by the grace of God. Okay. And to the entire congregation, this is where you all get to take part. You are witnesses that Ronan, Colin, and Winter have been baptized into the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. You are also to remember them before God in your prayers and to make certain as far as possible that they are brought up in the faith and fear of God so that they may abide in Christ from this day forward, even as now through baptism they have been grafted into him. We believe that God gives the gift of faith in baptism, but that, that, but that this gift will be lost unless the child is taught the word of God, upheld by prayer and given a Christian example to follow. This is first the responsibility of you, the parents, second of you, the sponsors, and third, the responsibility of us, the entire congregation. May we be faithful in this responsibility and privilege. Peace be with you. Amen. You guys. Congregation, let's rise and sing together hymn number 257, Break Thou the Bread of Life.
Okay, for our communion service today, for the liturgy, we are going to be using the blue booklets that you have in your pews, and we're going to be starting on page 10. Uh, the words are going to be on the screen. If you know the music, you can just follow along. Otherwise, I'll try to prompt you with what pages that we are on as we go through. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hid, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Jesus Christ our Lord. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Most merciful God, we confess that we are in bondage to sin and cannot free ourselves. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed. By what we have done, and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us, forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. In the mercy of Almighty God, Jesus Christ was given to die for you and for his sake, God forgives you all your sins. To those who believe in Jesus Christ, he gives the power to become the children of God and bestows on them the Holy Spirit. Amen. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all.
Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we give you thanks this day for our opportunity to come to you to worship and praise you, to lift up your name, and that, Lord, we would also be fed by the songs that we sing, by, the, by your word which is proclaimed in this service. We pray this in Jesus' holy and precious name. Amen. Our, faith, our service continues with the confession of faith using the words of the Nicene Creed. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of his Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten, not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us and for our salvation came down from heaven and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary, and was made man and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried, and the third day he rose again according to the scriptures and ascended into heaven and is seated on the right hand of the Father, and he shall come again with glory to judge both the living and the dead whose kingdom shall have no end. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds with the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshiped and glorified, who spoke by the prophets. And I believe one holy Christian and apostolic church. I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins, and I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. You may be seated. The Old Testament lesson is from Jeremiah chapter 28, verses 5 through 9. Then the prophet Jeremiah spoke to Hannah, the prophet of the pre to, in the presence of the priest and all the people who were standing in the house of the Lord. And the prophet Jeremiah said, Amen. May the Lord do so. May the Lord make the words that you have prophesied come true and bring back to this place from Babylon the vessels of the house of the Lord and all the exiles. Yet hear now this word that I speak in your hearing and in the hearing of all the people, the prophets who precede you and me from ancient times prophesied war, famine, and pestilence against many countries and great kingdoms. As for the prophet who prophesies peace, when the word of that prophet comes to pass, then it will be known that the Lord has truly sent the prophet. The psalm for today is from Psalm chapter 119, verses 153 through 160. I will read the light print. Please follow with the bold. Look on the affliction and deliver me, for I do not forget your law. Salvation is far from the wicked, for they do not seek your statute. Many are my persecutors and my adversaries, but I do not swerve from your testimonies. Consider how I love your precepts. Give me life according to your steadfast love. The epistle lesson for today is from Romans, the seventh chapter, verses 1 through 13. Or do you not know, brothers, for I am speaking to those who know the law, that the law is binding on a person only as long as he lives. 
for a married woman who is bound by law to her husband while he lives. But if her husband dies, she is released from the law of marriage. Accordingly, she will be called an adulteress if she lives with another man while her husband is alive. But if her husband dies, she is free from the law. And if she marries another man, she is not an adulteress. Likewise, my brothers, you also have died to the law through the bloody or through the body of Christ, so that you may belong to another, to him who has been raised from the dead, in order that he may bear fruit for God. For while we were living in the flesh, our sinful passions aroused by the law were at work in our members to bear fruit for death. But now we are released from the law, having died to that which held us captive, so that we serve in the way, new way of the spirit and not in the old way of the written code. What then shall we say, that the law is sin? By no means. Yet if it had not been for the law, I would not have known sin. For I would not have known what it is to co covet if the law had not said, you shall not covet. But sin seizing an opportunity through the commandments pro produced in me all kinds of covetousness. For apart from the law, sin lies dead. I was once alive apart from the law, but when the commandment came, sin came alive and I died. The very commandment that promised life proved to be death to me. For sin, seizing an opportunity through the commandments, deceived me, and through it killed me. So the law is holy, and the commandment is holy, and righteous, and good. Did that which is good then bring death to me? By no means. It was sin producing death in me through what was is good, in order that sin might be shown in the sin and through the commandment right might become sinful beyond measure. Here ends the reading of God's word. At the top of page 13 in our service book, please rise. I'll do the alleluia. <laughs> We're going to try this um, above that, the Alleluia, before that. There's, we don't do that? Okay, we don't do that. I'm learning too. We'll get that. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> yeah. Okay, um, our gospel lesson for today is from the book of Matthew, chapter 10, verses 34 to 42. Do not think that I have come to bring peace to the earth. I have not come to bring peace, but a sword. For I have come to set a man against his father, and a daughter against her mother, and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law, and a person's enemies will be those of his own household. Whoever loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me, and whoever loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me, and whoever does not take his cross and follow me is not worthy of me. Whoever finds his life will lose it. Whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. Whoever receives you receives me, and whoever receives me receives him who sent me. The one who receives a prophet because he is a prophet will receive a prophet's reward. And the one who receives a righteous person because he is a righteous person will receive a righteous person's reward. And whoever gives one of these little ones even a cup of cold water because he is a disciple, truly I say to you, he will by no means lose his reward. Here ends the reading of God's word. <laughs> Heavenly Father, we do give you praise. And as we hear your word proclaimed today, we pray that our hearts, our minds would be open to it and that we would receive it, Lord, in such a way that we can make us grow closer to you and become more like you and be able to share this same word with our friends and families and those who we encounter in the world around us. 
We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Okay. Matthew chapter 10. I, you know, we, I, I went to the epistle lesson last week because it was just more of what we had the previous week. Uh, but if you recall, it was talking to the, the, the disciples, as Matthew calls them, and it's a little bit confusing because other gospels, when it says disciples, it seems like it's referring to all of those who would call themselves Christians and sit under Jesus' feet and, and to learn from him. But Matthew uses the word disciples very specifically about 30 times throughout his gospel to refer to the 12. This is where, like in, in Luke and John, you would hear apostle, apostles, but this is this is the, the, the close group, the 12 that Jesus is speaking to when he talks about disciples. And this is who he's talking to. It's clear from context. And so it's interesting how sometimes we try to apply these verses to the whole of Christendom when it's kind of talking to the church leaders. Not that that's a bad thing, right? If, if there's a requirement of Jesus to give to, let's say, pastors, uh, maybe as lay people, there should be this, let's just have our eyes open to that and, and receive God's word in the same way. So Jesus says, do not think that I have come to bring peace to the earth. I have not come to bring peace, but a sword. That's a comfortable, fun, loving verse, isn't it? A warm, fuzzy feeling when so many out there are preaching prosperity gospel where if you believe in Jesus and sit in church on a Sunday and give a certain amount of money or whatever, your life is going to be just happiness and joy and you're going to get more friends and, and, and everything is going to go good. You won't have any stress. The anxiety will just melt away. But Jesus' words, I have not come to bring peace, but a sword. And again, in the context of the ministry of the disciples bringing God's word to the world, harmony is not going to be achieved, rather division. And I talk about this every once in a while, the, the word doctrine, because there are churches out there where you bring up doctrine, they say, oh, you don't want to talk about doctrine, because doctrine, at its core, its job is to divide. That's all it does is divide. It divides churches, it divides families. You can't talk about doctrine. Well, in fact, doctrine does divide, but you need to be very specific what doctrine does divide. It divides truth from error. It divides truth from lies. How do you build a Christian church without setting a precedent for what truth is and then rejecting the errors of the world around it, the culture that tries to push it in different directions? Does this not require the breakdown of peace and not always just like from our church or from you to your neighbor or somebody that you just don't agree with but sometimes in your own very homes sometimes in your own congregation sometimes you change pews because you don't want to sit next to one of them did i strike a nerve <laughs> giggling It's not the just, can't we all get along? We cannot coddle obstinate sinners. And, and, and let me be clear on that. I use the word obstinate. These are people, the sinners who reject God, who reject Christ as Savior. We can't coddle that, right? We, can't, we should not coddle any form of sin. We should be willing to call it out. I stayed w w with a host uh, family up in, in, in Snohomish, Smoky Point, Arlington. I don't know where, you, anyway. It, w this last week when I was at our Bible camp, we have a day camp. And so I, at night, I went to these pe nice people's homes. And, and this guy, I, I love him. He, he, his name is Thor. How many people do you meet named Thor? And, and, and a little bit of his personality is 
built up in his name. I hope he's not watching this, but um, <laughs> we were talking about different people and, and, and the, the subject of like a young couple moving in together came up. And Thor's response, fornicators! And I was like, wow, that's strong, you know, but you know what? That's what it is. When you move in and live together before you get married, and as a culture, we've been taught to not be mean and to be nice. Thor didn't care what the culture said. For, that's fornicating! He, he was very clear and pointed, called it for what it was. How many times in our sinful lives do we not want to talk about it and not want to address it because we don't, we value peace far more than we value truth and doctrine, and it should not be. Verse 35, for I have come to set a man against his father and a daughter against her mother and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law and a person's enemies will be those of his own household. The one that really makes sense in there is that the in-laws, the daughter-in-laws, and mother-in-laws fight. That's, that's like nature built into us, right? We see that all the time. But no, no. Um, set against is an interesting word. In, in the word enemy here, in the Greek, it's not necessarily an enemy because we're, we're talking about within a household here. We're talking about within a close family. And this word enemy can also be translated, well, it's why they chose the word enemy. It's hard to translate. It's um, not necessarily somebody that hates you, but it's somebody that would scoff at you. Somebody that would look down on your decisions. Somebody that would be like, eh, that person doesn't really, they don't get it. When you have that in your household, it creates division. It creates struggle and strife. Verse 37, whoever loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And whoever loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. Again, let me remind you that this text, Jesus is speaking directly to his, or, or no, <laughs> We have, we have made a shift in the text. He was speaking directly to his 12, right? And now the pronouns, the, the, the text of the Greek changes. He opens the door. He uses the, the word whoever. So no longer just the 12 leaders who should know better in all these instances, but opens the door to all of us. Whoever loves father or mother more than me, whoever places anything ahead of God, is not worthy of God. Not just the disciples, but all of us. When, when I do premarital counseling, I often have people take a, a sheet and I throw some words out there like children, your spouse, your parents, uh, your job, your church ministries, and God. And I ask them to put those, those things in a list you know, of your priorities. And, and because you're sitting in a pastor's office, people always will put God first. That's the easy one to get. And then they will put, the, the mistake that is made is they'll put their church ministries as like second or third. You know, they put church ministries as being more important than their, their job. And, and to which I say, no. Um, yes, God should be first. Yes, your spouse should be second. Yes, your, your children should be third. How many of you agree with that? So, sometimes... Boy, parents can get testy on that one. They, they, they had their children. I'm like, did you vow um, to, to love your children in sickness and in health until death do you part before you were allowed to have them? You didn't. And so your relationship to your, your spouse needs to be looked after and taken care of with, with great interest. And, and this is why uh, the divorce rate in our country spikes at empty nest when children leave home because spouses have put their love for their children ahead of each other and then the children leave home and they look at each other and say who are you, you, you your your devotion to god must come first your devotion to your your family must come second your spouse first and, and children you know and then your, your your devotion to your job your vocation should be next and beyond that is, is your, your friends and your hobbies and then church ministries 
falls last on that list. It doesn't fall last so that you don't have to do it, but it falls last on that list to where if you are having struggles at home, you might need to skip choir practice to take care of the family. Verse 38. Whoever does not take his cross and follow me is not worthy of me. And here's another Greek one for you today. The word take, because this, this, I've heard this proclaimed as take. I've heard it take up. It can be translated receive. And, and one of the commentators that I pay attention to makes a big point of this. Is when, when you say the word take, you get this actively going and grabbing something and pulling it to you, and, and it's, it's what you're doing. Um, but the word receive reminds you of, of that there's gift involved in this. And if you hear this verse, whoever does not receive his cross and follow me is not worthy of me. And to think about that in that sense, it's not just that we're called to take up our cross, but we're called to receive it. And that means God gives it, right? It's a gift. And if you don't receive a gift, you reject it. And this is clear throughout all of the New Testament. If you reject the gift God has given you, you exclude yourself from heaven. And by gift, I don't mean your talents and your abilities. I mean the gift that God gave you through his son dying on the cross for your sins so that you could be forgiven. Verse 39 Oh, I I missed something in there. Verse 38 also has that wonderful word, follow. We are to follow him. And if we do not receive that gift of the cross and follow Christ, then we are no longer worthy. And, And the word worthy, every time I see it in Scripture, well, maybe not every time, but most of the time when I see it in Scripture, for some reason my mind is reminded of, I think it was a 90s movie called Wayne's World. Does anybody remember Wayne's World? And Aerosmith came out on the stage and Wayne and Garth fall to their knees and go, we're not worthy, we're not worthy. And they bow down and they, and they, they just elevate Aerosmith above them in every way imaginable. And I think how often do we do that in our own faith? Remind ourselves of how awesome and mighty God's love is for us, that we are indeed not worthy of it. If we were worthy, you know, Jesus wouldn't have had to die for our sins. But we're not. And so that gift becomes all the more precious to us. Verse 39, whoever finds his life will lose it, and whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. The word life here is the same as could be translated your soul. It is your existence, your being, all of your passions and desires, your love, your hate, all of that, who you are as a person, that is what God is calling you to find. Whoever finds his life will lose it, and whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. Can you set aside who you are so that you can become who God wants you to be? The word lose there, in, in, in reference to life, it, it's, it's interesting because it can also be translated to destroy, to break down. So you have desires in your sinful mind that would pull you away from Christ and separate you from him. And here we are called to destroy those. It's not just, oh, I think I'm going to not do that it's bad stop it destroy it we need to be on guard against our sin verse 40 whoever receives you receives me and whoever receives me receives him who sent me now we have this same take word translated as receive to 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 let him in and and this um we we begin to to see the world at the time, if they were, if anyone out there, again, this isn't pointed to the, the, the disciples, the 12, but those who would receive the 12, if 
a disciple, if one of the apostles came and knocked on your door and said, hey, can I stay with you for a couple days while I preach in your town? And you said, no, God wouldn't be very happy with that. If you said, yes, there are blessings that would follow in this instance, right? Whoever receives you receives me. Whoever receives me receives him who sent me. It's not just that you are receiving the apostle or a missionary or a pastor or um, college kids who might be coming to lead our vacation Bible school into your home, but you are receiving Christ when you do that. And when you receive those people, you should love them as you love Christ. This, this verse also has built into it in the Lutheran Church what we call the office of the keys. Because it's not just that you're receiving people, but it's that there's a chance that you might need to reject people as well. And we would reject people based on their sin. And if somebody is living in the midst of outward sin that the world can see and they are proud of it and they're telling the world about it, then we are actually called as Christians to point it out. The behavior that you're exhibiting is sinful. And if it's in the church, we are called to tell people that they should not be in the church. We can, we can push them out of the church in order to drive the point home that we want them to be restored unto, unto Christ. We do not want them to continue living in a sinful way and claiming that they are under Christ's banner. It excludes the unrepentant sinners to hell, but it absolves the repentant sinners unto heaven. It's, it's not all about sin. It's all about unrepentant sin and repentant sin. It's easy to tell people, you're a sinner, you're going to hell. But we have to remember we're all in the same category when it comes to sin. We fall short. Okay. Verse 41. The one who receives a prophet because he is a prophet will receive a prophet's reward. And the one who receives a righteous person because he is a righteous person will receive a righteous person's reward. It's the same certainty from a pastor as if from Christ himself. If you receive Christ's word, the word of God, if you receive it, as it is brought to you by a pastor. So I'm up here preaching to you from the word of God. If you receive that word, as long as it's from the Bible, then you're receiving that word, not as if it's coming out of my mouth, but as if Christ himself is preaching to you. Now, it's a little bit of a humbling thing for a pastor to say that, because I don't believe that when I open my mouth, Christ speaks any more powerfully than if any one of you were to open your Bible and read, okay? I don't want to set myself up on some strange pedestal where I'm like, oh, Christ said this, so I say it to you. No, it is the Word of God that contains that power, and when we hear the Word of God's proclaimed, we need to, to know that that is from Christ, Verse 42, and whoever gives one of these little ones even a cup of cold water because he is a disciple, truly I say to you, he will by no means lose his reward. Th this one is, is difficult for me because when I read that and I understand it, I think of the little ones in the church. I think of the children and I think we should be nice to the children. But Jesus uses this word, disciple, where in the Gospel of Matthew, 29 other times, it very specifically is, is pointed to his 12 that he has sent out. And so when Jesus says here, in the Gospel of Matthew, one of these little ones, anyone who gives one of these little ones a cup of cold water, he, he is speaking of his 12. It's not, it's not quite what we think of, right? Does that mean we're not supposed to be good to little kids? No, absolutely not. But Jesus, in, in the midst of sending his 12 out into the world to go preach and to proclaim and to, and to heal and to perform miracles, 
he is talking about in this whole section about how whether the world is going to be hospitable to that and invite them into their homes and help them, or they're going to reject them. And in Christ says, anyone who even gives them a cup of cold water, it's going to be good. I say to you, he will by no means lose his reward. Accept and help those who bring you God's word. Um, it is God's spirit-filled word, the spirit-filled word of God brought to you by any pastor, evangelist, preacher, um, tent meeting speaker, if they are bringing you God's word. When the law and the gospel are proclaimed, receive it as though it's from Christ himself. Receive it as though it's from Christ himself because God's word is, is God's word. Can I say that again? Because God's word is God's word. And I say that, and I shouldn't say this, but I'm going to say it anyway. I feel like Kamala Harris giving a speech, but, but I think this is an important one to repeat. God's word is God's word. We're going to say the same thing over and over again to define, to define itself with its own words. We can't, we can't miss that. We can't miss that. Okay? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we give you thanks for your word, which you have indeed given to us. Help us to receive that word, Lord, in such a way that our hearts and minds are always open to it, that we are willing to share your word with our friends, family, neighbors, co-workers. And Lord, as we do that, that we can become more like you. And we pray this in Jesus' holy and precious name. Amen. Let us rise and sing together hymn number 141, A Mighty Fortress.
be seated. Let And let's sing together hymn number 461, Onward Christian Soldiers.
May the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance on you and give you peace. Amen.